Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for our webinar today, what, uh, what Business Owners Need to Know About Employee Benefits. Uh, today's session is going to be a great session. A uh, couple of things. Um, one, just a quick reminder that this is uh, not intended to be professional advice. This is just general information. Um, if you have specific questions for the presenter or for me, over on the right hand side, there is a comments box and you can uh, type a, a message to me directly. It will remain private or you can post something in the group questions um, and the questions um, may or may not uh, be private depending on the options you pick. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Jessica. Uh, Jessica's a partner at Couillard Group and she uh, has been looking after our benefits for a few years now. And so uh, we know her, we like her, and uh, and we trust her to give you some good ideas today. So Jessica. Great, can you hear me? We got gotcha. you. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much, Clayton, for the introduction. And thank you for having me. And um, great to be here with everybody on the call today. And yeah, as Clayton introduced, I'm just going to be talking to um, all of you business owners out there about what you need to know about employee benefits. So. I know there's probably a mix out there for people who may already have existing benefit plans and are looking for some information on some of the trends and innovations in the market, or maybe you're brand new to the employee benefit space and it's something that you're just looking at getting set up. So hopefully a little bit of um, something for everyone out there today. Um, and I guess just before I dive in here, you know, and well, I'll, I'll get right into it and we can just dive in. So. So why employee benefits? So, you know, whether you have a plan or you're new to thinking about one, why might you consider adding this to your uh, your remuneration package? And benefits are something that really are evolving and they're changing a lot. And employees, what they're looking for from an employer is also changing a lot. So what we're seeing is that, you know, basic salary packages aren't everything that is important to your current employees or, you know, prospective employees. And your benefits package really does make up a big part of that overall remuneration package. So looking at it is um, something that's more and more becoming important. Um, Benefit plans are also, they're a great way to demonstrate and not only demonstrate, but actively invest in your company's values and your culture. So what types of things you put in your benefit plan and the things, how you structure it really does say a lot about you as an organization, what's important to you. And you're going to hear me talk a lot about wellness today because it's a really uh, topical point right now. But if wellness is something that's really important to you as an employer, if it's a value that you have, there are you know, different ways to structure that plan to really make sure that that value is communicated. Um, the next thing is a duty of care. And more and more, we're seeing an onus be put onto employers to help look after their employees. So employers are no longer just a, a paycheck for, for staff. Um, really more and more, it's becoming something that people are looking to their employers to help provide that overall package to help them care for their families, physical and mental health, for their physical and mental health and well-being. Um, the next thing is the price effectiveness of pooling. So where benefit plans really all got started was that, you know, there's this idea with insurance that when you pool the risks of a greater group, there's a way to bring the pricing down. So when you look at putting an insured benefit plan in place, you get some of those price effectiveness of pooling from having you know, that bigger group being a part of that pricing. Tax benefits is a really big one. So when we're looking at extended healthcare benefits, dental benefits, or health spending account, and I'll dive into all the details on those later, those are one of the last ways for you to pass remuneration to your employees tax free. So the premiums for these benefits are a deductible expense to the business owner and not taxable benefits in most cases to the employee. So let's just take an example where you as an employer might contribute $1,000 in a year for 
extended health care benefits for a particular employee. And let's say that employee has a $10,000 annual drug cost for a drug that they require for a health condition. That $10,000 that they receive in claim reimbursement from the insurance company is not going to be a taxable benefit to them. So effectively, you've been able to pass that extra $10,000 onto them tax-free. So that's really neat. And the last thing is protecting your business most valuable resource. So if you're a business owner that's growing and you're looking to you know, increase the size of your organization, you're likely learning more and more that those employees really are the backbone of your organization and helping you to build that thriving business. So a benefit plan is a way to help protect those valuable employees. So business owners out there, if you don't have a benefit plan and you're wondering, how do I start this? Where do I start? There's lots of noise and options out in the market. Um, you know, how do you how do you get going? So we really think, you know, at Cooler Group, if we're working with a new client, that it's really important to start up here in a discovery stage. So it's really easy to just go and jump to a carrier and put a really kind of simple nuts and bolts plan in place. But it's really important, again, to start in a different place and really think about that value and culture that you want the plan to communicate. And so we could really kind of refer to that as your you know, benefits philosophy and also looking at sustainability. You know, if you're looking to grow your organization over time, how do you want to build a plan that can grow and adapt with your organization? You know, then Jessica, I, um, if I could jump in on that one, that yeah. was one of the key points for us with you guys that was that was really differentiated um, because a lot of that, a lot of those are big words and you think, you know, I need to be a big company uh, to access this stuff. And, um, you know, you guys really brought that down. Like we only had two staff, I think, when we got going or something. And uh, you really have a system to bring that down to a level um, where we were able to understand it. So I just wanted to throw a bit of praise out for you guys on that because that was a key differentiator for you. Yeah. Thank you. And I appreciate that. And it's a really great point too that, you know, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, but you don't need to be a huge organization with, you know, a big HR department to have a really fantastic benefit plan offering. And, you know, to your point, Clayton, you know, you can be a three person organization and have a really robust, great benefit plan in place with the right team behind you. So um, thanks for that. It's a great point. Um, yeah, so moving on from that, we want to examine the demographics of your company and consider what's important to your employees. Um, so I know with with uh, Aiken Henderson, we did a survey, right? So we conduct that on your behalf and um, survey your employees, especially if you are a little bit of a larger organization and you don't necessarily have a really great pulse on exactly what might be important. A survey is a great way to just give a sense of the kinds of things that employees are looking for. And even just looking at demographics, that can tell you a lot. So if you have a little bit of an older population in your employee base, we know that things like drug care and pharmacy care, um, possibly long-term disability or life insurance might be more important to an older demographic generally speaking, not always. Um, and on the flip side, a really young demographic that might be single and without families might be looking for a little bit more flexibility um, and not necessarily a plan that is a little bit more stringent. So we like to look at that as well when we're into this kind of discovery phase. And then we move down into looking at a preliminary plan design just as a starting point for a budget. So we take that discovery information and we put together a preliminary design that's going to be used to take it out to market. And again, this is just going to be a starting point for us to kind of see what kind of pricing are we looking at and does it fit. So we make that preliminary plan design together and we take it out to some select carriers that seem to be a fit out in the market. When we receive all that back, we compare, we tweak and we modify. So perhaps we get these um, quotes back on this plan design and the budget's just a little bit too high. So we want to scale it back a little bit or on the flip side, maybe there's a little bit of room to kind of um, bring the benefits up. But if you are starting a new benefit plan, we really like to emphasize to keep it simple to start. It's better to add benefits over time 
then have to take benefits away. So you don't need to start with the Cadillac and realize in six months that, geez, you know, this is just a bit too much for us right now and have to take it down. Start simple and add benefits over time. Um, from there, we would pick the carrier or different carriers that we want to go with, finalize that plan design and implement. And, you know, this is where a really great team can come into place, whether it be an advisor, a plan administrator in the insurance carrier. That's really your team when you're looking at benefits to help make sure that implementation goes smoothly. Make sure that your employees are really well educated on what benefits they're going to be getting and make sure everybody's set up properly. And then finally, we move into this monitor, review and revise phase. Um, and so that'll kind of bring me into this next slide. This is reviewing your existing plan. So for business owners out there, if you already have a plan or for those new business owners, when you're a year or so down the road, we want to get into this review stage. And again, it's really so important to really continually be doing this discovery. Um, you know, does that discovery happen every year? Sometimes, not always but the place you started may not be where you are now. So sometimes your business has changed, your culture has changed, and so it's important to sometimes come back to that discovery and, and see where your business is at. Re-examine the demographics and evaluate your claims experience. Claims experience, so this is going to be where are claims being paid out in your benefit plan? And although you know we're obviously for privacy purpose not going to see you know, which in particular employees are making claims, but we can see overall, is there a lot of claims for psychology visits? Is there a lot of claims in, the, in drugs? Is there a lot of claims in other paramedical practitioners like massage? Just because this will help us to determine, you know, is the plan design really suiting what's being used? Then we look at determining when the last time your plan was taken to market. You know, we really do think that it's important to, you know, stick with a carrier and build a relationship with a carrier, but that doesn't mean that it's not a good idea to, from time to time, do a market check and make sure that your plan is competitive from a price perspective and make sure that that carrier is still the right fit for your group. And then depending on the outcomes of all of that, possibly you might be making some d plan design changes. Maybe in some instances you're changing carriers. Um, but the point really of all of this is that a benefit plan isn't a set it and forget it type of um, experience. At least every year, we want to be making sure that we're doing some of these things to always make sure that you're getting a lot of value out of the plan. And I won't go into all of these components in a terrible amount of detail, so not to bore everybody, um, but just for especially people on the call that might be you know, new to benefit plans, just to go through what are the components of a traditional insured benefit plan. And so the components will be broken up into three segments here, the insurance, the extended health care, and the dental care. There's lots of other add-ons that we can um, talk about towards the end, but these would be kind of the, the main nuts and bolts that you would be working with on the traditional side. And so just really quickly on the insurance, life insurance, this is typically always something that you'll have at least a small amount of just as a basic amount in a traditional plan. And accidental death and dismemberment usually comes right alongside with that, and that's coverage that pays if someone um, has a premature death as a result of an accident or a loss of limbs as a result of an accident. Dependent life is going to be put in for plans, especially where maybe a lot of the employees have families, and this is going to be life insurance for spouse or children. Short-term disability. This is a weekly benefit that gets paid if an employee is unable to work due to disability. That could be illness or injury. And this is going to pay um, either right away from disability or seven days, depending, and take you all the way till about 17 weeks, at which time a long-term disability benefit would be paid. And I am just going through this pretty quick, but I would be happy to answer you know, any questions that people have on these. But um, long-term disability, again, is going to kind of start at that four-month mark. If an employee is still unable to come to work because of that disability, it's going to pay them a monthly benefit, potentially all the way out till they're 65 if they continue to be disabled 
all the way through. So um, especially on the long term disability side, if it's something that is a fit, this could be a really big benefit for employees to have included. Uh, and the last is uh, critical illness coverage. Critical illness coverage is a one time lump sum payout if an employee is diagnosed with a critical illness. In most plans, there's 26 covered illnesses. The, by far the most common three are cancer, stroke and heart attack. So those are the insurance components and this is really if you want to think of it as a bit of a buffet to um, aside from the life insurance to kind of select what is important and appropriate for your organization. Moving over into the extended health care, um, this um, would cover a, a really broad range of different things, but the big ones would be your drug, your pharmacy care, and paramedical practitioners. Those are the big ones that um, we see a lot of usage in these plans. Paramedical practitioners is going to be the, you know, the ones that are most popular being massage, chiropractic, physiotherapy, um, but also things like hospital, vision, medical equipment, travel coverage would all be under that extended health care banner. And then over to dental care, a little more self-explanatory, there's different levels of dental care that you can include in a plan. Basic and preventative would be kind of the, the basic level that you might have covered. Then moving into major dental, things like your crowns and extractions, um, orthodontic, dentures, dentures and bridge work. This is where um, into the paramedical, that's where, you know, currently big issue is, you know, psychology, psychiatric stuff, right? Like going to that's see those. Right. I mean, that's pretty relevant right now, especially with uh, with the age that we're living in. I think it's becoming even more relevant. Absolutely. And I, I'm going to talk a lot about mental health and that's really that specific issue. So just as an Amazing. example for paramedicals, um, you know, in a lot of plans, you know, you typically would have maybe between three to five hundred dollars per year per practitioner as coverage. That would, that's what I would say would be kind of a, a standard benefit. So that would mean for psychology, which would fall under paramedical, that an employee, that person would have, let's say, five hundred dollars of psychology visits in a year. But, you know, we know that the kind of the going rate for about an hour of a psychology visit is, you know, going to be about two hundred dollars. So that $500 benefit is only going to give someone maybe two to three visits. So I'm going to talk about some really great innovations in that mental health space because it, um, especially with COVID, um, is a super um, important issue that we're having to help address. Um, again here, just a really high level overview, um, how are benefit plans priced? Um, I will again happy to answer specific questions, but I'll go through it relatively quickly. But just important to know if you're looking again at a traditional insured plan with a carrier such as Canada Life or Manulife, the pricing that you have on that plan is going to be fixed only for that particular benefit year, usually just a year in most cases. And each year when your plan renews, your pricing is going to be reevaluated and lots of different factors that are going to come into that that you can see here, but really how the plan is used, what are the claims that were paid out compared to what the insurance company thought was going to be paid out. That's referred to as a target loss ratio. That's a big factor, but also demographic changes, trends, carriers, expenses, all of those things are going to come into um, what the plan is going to renew at. So just important to know if you're new that these um, the pricing is kind of subject to change each year. And just a caution note here, if you have an existing plan, a caution in what I call chasing rates. So especially in this market, insurance companies are really eager to get business. And so they are really offering a lot of them some really, really aggressive pricing. But what we also like to, always like to caution people is that if the plan has been underbid, so the insurance carrier is not asking for enough premium come that first renewal you likely have to be prepared for a really big increase to your rates so we always just like to make sure that when we're looking at taking plans out to market that we're looking at how that those carriers are pricing the plans it's really important okay so just getting into some of the more exciting stuff you know what are some of the trends we're seeing in benefits 
and what are some innovations that we're seeing. So as I mentioned right at the start, you know, wellness, wellness and more wellness really is the biggest trend that we're seeing in, in benefits right now. So we're looking at mental health, financial health and physical health. How can benefit plans help to address all components of wellness for an employee, not just you know physical health, which in the past plans really have been targeted at. Let's look, look at your physical health, where when we're looking more into that mental health and financial health space, this is in that more of that preventative stuff. How can business owners help to offer their employees things that are going to help prevent illness or prevent time away from work? And I'm going to talk about some really great innovations, um, specifically some mental health. Um, a really, you know, big topic right now that you might have heard about health spending accounts. Um, so when you're looking at a benefit plan, how do you know should you do a health spending account versus a traditional plan? So a health spending account is going to be a set allotment of funds. Let's just say it's a thousand dollars per year per employee. That employee is able to spend that money as they choose, so long as it's an eligible expense. So your drugs, dental, paramedicals, all those sorts of things would fit under eligible expenses for a health spending account. So these offer a lot of flexibility uh, for the employees. And so whether people have kids that have, you know, requiring braces or someone just really likes to have massage or psychology visits, this account just gives everybody the ability to choose how they spend those funds. As an employer, you also know that those funds are capped. So if you have 10 employees and they each have $1,000, you know that your um, cost exposure there is going to be $10,000, you know, at the at the maximum. So what's the benefits of the health spending account versus the traditional insured plan? And, you know, as always, you know, it really does depend um, on the needs of the organization. Again, coming back to that discovery, but we're really seeing a hybrid model coming out where some components of the plan are done here on the traditional side and things like the life insurance, the disability insurance, um, and even the drug coverage um, sometimes are really great places to have under this traditional. And again, if we look at some examples in um, with drugs, if you have just a health spending account and you know this employee has a thousand dollars, what happens to that employee when they have you know a sudden onset of an illness and a fifty thousand dollar drug expense a catastrophic drug expense they would have the thousand dollars that they could use that health spending account for but then you know where do they get the other 49 so the traditional insured plan can really help when we're looking at really some of that true insurance that we maybe want to have in the plan and then pairing it with the health spending account to give that flexibility um, is kind of more and more what we're seeing. And along that line of the health spending account, we have wellness spending accounts. So health spending accounts, because they need to be CRA eligible expenses, the, these are going to be non-taxable benefits to the employee, just like the insured benefits. A wellness spending account is going to be a taxable benefit. So if you have a $500 wellness spending account and the employee spends that $500, that $500 is going to be added back on um, as taxable income at the end of the year. But what's really great about these accounts um, when we talk about benefit plans being a way to demonstrate your culture is you as the business owner get to dictate how is this account used. So one of the most popular ones that we see these accounts used for is fitness and wellness. So employees are able to put their gym memberships through, put their yoga classes through, their home gym equipment. Um, and these really can be used to, to show what's important to you as a business owner. And you're saying, listen, I'm effectively giving you a $500 raise. You're going to pay some tax on it, but I want to make sure you're spending it in this area. So those are um, really growing in popularity, especially right now. Um, employee assistance plans, um, when we're talking about mental health, this is one way that employers can help offer some additional support. Um, employee assistance plans offer a, a big range of support, whether it be for crisis management, divorce counseling, general mental health support, 
financial planning, the lots of different areas that an employee assistance plan can step in uh, when an employee has something in their life going on. And another trend in benefits just overall, technology, flexibility and accessibility. Um, and I think COVID and this work from home movement has really pressed this point forward, right? Employees want benefits that they can access from their phones that offer them some flexibility to customize it to what's important in their life and to have good technology at their fingertips. Some noteworthy innovations in the market. Um, so these are just a few. There's really so many right now. Um, but these top two, this virtual healthcare um, and dialogue specifically is a virtual healthcare provider. Um, there's a there's a good handful of good virtual healthcare providers out there. Um, now this is going to be something that employees have on their phones access to medical pr practitioners that they can access all on their phone. And so dialogue, I'll just talk about specifically just to give you some examples. Um, so dialogue, you can, as an employee, dial into their chat um, for any kind of physical health concern. And I'll talk about the mental health component here in a moment. Um, but you're able to then um, have a video consultation with either a nurse, a nurse practitioner, or a physician. And in lots of instances, have a prescription given to you and a resolution without really having to leave your house. Um, so big movements that we're seeing towards a virtual health healthcare platform as a partner to your traditional healthcare model, right? Um, just to allow you to not have to take a half a day off of work to go see a doctor or go wait in line for two hours at a walk-in clinic with your young child. Um, this is a way to kind of a first line, maybe be get some support and a resolution without having to leave your house. And so dialogue specifically, when they, off, when they launched their virtual health care platform for physical health, saw a huge demand in mental health inquiries that were coming through. So people were dialing in specifically with mental health issues. So what they've done is created a completely separate mental health application, which um, is really an incredible offering. Um, depending on the organization, you know, it's going to be between about five to nine dollars per employee per month. And with that, the employee is going to have unlimited access to mental health support. Again, all on their phone, all virtual. So whether that be psychology visits, psychotherapy, counseling, therapists, caseworkers, they're going to be able to, from the comfort of their home, get a lot of that support. So we're really seeing a big push for um, empl employers who are looking to have some kind of mental health support. Um, you know, Dialogue reports that 27% of their users are reporting high or extreme stress levels, right? Which isn't surprising in this time. And Statistics Canada did a survey in COVID where over half of the respondents reported a decline in their mental health since the onset of COVID. So, you know, mental health really is a big area that, um, you know, we are able to pay attention to through a benefit offering. Um, and so that's a, a, a really innovative company that's doing some great things. Um, Flex Accounts, um, my HSA, over here you see their logo, um, they're a company that we use and again a really great technology offering to um, be a provider for health spending accounts and wellness spending accounts. And they specifically offer a Flex Account which allows employees to decide, I have my thousand dollars from my employer, I'm going to put half in a health spending account and half in a wellness spending account, or I'm going to put it all in a wellness account. It's up to them. So again, just giving more options to um, help with that trend towards flexibility and customization. Um, some neat innovations in the financial health space, Canada Life, uh, they're offering now what's called a coho card. This is a refillable, uh, reloadable prepaid credit card and it allows for micro savings. So employees are able to use this preloaded Visa card, which helps with their savings and their financial planning. And they're able to say, listen, on every transaction, I'd like to round it up by $5 and I'd like to have that $5 go towards my RSP. So just this micro savings um, functionality that allows employees to start saving little bits at a time. 
And they're also offering now a group RESP. Um, group RRSPs, registered retirement savings plans, have been around for a long time. And we're now seeing a push in the market to go to group um, registered education savings plans to make it easier for employees to know how to invest in an RESP. So those are some great innovations that we're seeing to help um, address employees' financial health. Um, and the last one, a, a neat organization called Pocket Pills. This is a really making the pharmacy more direct to consumer. So they coordinate with a pharmacy and um, package up. Uh, uh, let's say you have three or four medications that you have to take on a daily basis. They package them up into daily little packages and they deliver them to your door and everything can be done on the app. You can do this for elderly parents. Um, so again, just making it more accessible to um, you know have the overall health care and support that people need. And the last thing is just a few points on getting the most out of your benefit plan. So you know you've gone through all of this work and you've invested the you know the capital to have this benefit plan there. So how do you make sure that you're really getting the value out of that plan? Um, so first is just keeping up to date on these trends and technologies and innovations, um, especially right now we're seeing such great improvements. And so just making sure that you're always aware of what's available to you and keeping your plan current. Um, really, you know, increasingly important to pay attention to liability within your plan. Um, you know, this is something, you know, to always be speaking with your insurance carrier or your advisor to make sure that you're administering your plan properly to protect yourself from any potential liability with employees. It's really important and building a good team. So whether it is yourself as the business owner that's going to be administering the plan or whether an employee in your organization is doing it, really making sure that whoever is within your organization administering the plan um, is well trained and well supported. Um, an advisor who's going to just make sure that again you're always educated on the market and really should be there to be a bridge between you as the business owner and the insurance carriers, and also for you to your employees to really make sure that your employees are supported and getting value from the plan. Um, it's also really great if you, you know, have an advisor or someone from the insurance carrier who can come and talk to your employees and educate them on what you have. Again, you're making a big investment into having this plan you want to make sure that your employees know what they have, they know how to use it, and that any issues they're having are going to be resolved so that it's accessible to them. And the last one is just always finding ways to make your plan meaningful and accessible. Um, you know, as a business owner, we don't want to be feel like we're putting funds into something that isn't being used. So continuing to find ways to know that your staff is really valuing the plan that you've put in place for them. So I, I know I went through a lot of information there, but I just wanted to give, you know, a little bit of a, a high level overview. So I'd be more than happy to kind of open it up here and answer some questions. Thank you, Jessica. That was great. Um, why don't you uh, leave that screen share up and I'll put it up again at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> we have one or a couple questions here. Um, one from Rita. So how does the health spending account work? Is the employee responsible for drawing down the account based on receipts submitted? Question mark. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so how it would work, um, and I'll just use the example of how ours are administered here, but it would be the same most places that you would go to have your plan administered. So the employee is going to have the full amount of their funds replenished at the start of each year. Um, and as the employee has an expense, so let's say they go to the dentist and you don't have dental coverage elsewhere, they're going to take a picture of that dental receipt and they're going to go onto their system and make that claim, just like they would at you know, an insurance carrier. And then whoever is administering that claim is going to go and review it and make sure that it's eligible and correct and approve it. And then the, the claim would be processed and they would be reimbursed. And then with each claim, the funds would get drawn down until a point where they said, hey, sorry, your funds for the year are gone. 
Right on. Um, I, I I find that that uh, mental health, uh, the online, the, the techie innovation um, piece that you were talking about for the mental health for for not a lot per employee per month, uh, that's really intriguing. And actually, Ronnie, I know you're on this call. You should write that down. Maybe we want to look into that because um, that sounds awesome. Can you, how does that work? Like, what is the feedback that you're getting and, and what has been your customer's experience in using that? Yeah, I mean, we've gotten really incredible feedback um, and I think a couple of reasons. You know, mental health, unfortunately, still has uh, a bit of a stigma attached to it and people are sometimes a little bit afraid to reach out. And so, you know, a lot of times for someone to have to make an appointment and go in to see a therapist in an office, they might be nervous or, you know, feeling a little bit scared to do that. So having the ability to be in the security of their own home and be able to speak with someone on video. So you know, you're talking to a real person um, from the comfort of your home. There's this level of anonymity that I think gives people a lot of security in using it. And another big you know, feedback that we've gotten is the continuity of care. So often, again, in the mental health system, sometimes people are falling through the cracks, right? There isn't necessarily one person that is seeing people through their journey. And with this particular um, offering dialogue, the employees are assigned a case coordinator. So when someone kind of makes that first inquiry or first appointment, even though they might speak with a few different practitioners, they're going to have that coordinator who is following up to check in, to see how they're doing, to see if more appointments need to be scheduled. And I think that's also really incredible. So I guess just as a follow up, and then we do have a couple other questions. Is this like, are you seeing a lot of people use this when it's when they're at sort of crisis stage or or can we use that for regular, so regular maintenance, if you will? Um, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, and I think that's one of the best parts is um, something like the employee assistance plan that I mentioned, the EAP does have some great mental health support, but people have to be at a certain what they deem to be, you know, a certain level to get access to that free support. So someone who might just have a little bit of elevated anxiety or elevated stress in their life might not kind of qualify under that platform where with dialogue you really can be dialing in for something as simple as hey listen i am having a lot of stress at work or you know my kids are back to school and i'm feeling a bit nervous with these covid times and i need some tools to help manage that and so by having this ability to kind of dial in for something minor i think it's helping long term to prevent people having to wait till it's crisis time. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, perfect. from an employer standpoint too, um, when we're looking at long-term disability claims, mental health is the fastest growing reason for people going on long-term disability. Mm -hmm. So by having something where people are able to get that support early on, um, really also helps from your, your standpoint as an employer to help, you know, make sure people are staying healthy and able to stay at work. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's really important. Um, OK, yeah. so before I get to the next question, uh, I just want to point out that we're on a 20 second delay. <clears throat> so if you do have questions, you might want to get them in now uh, so that we don't shut down the uh, session before your question pops up. Next question, Jessica, what are the penalties to leave a plan to go to another plan if the company's outgrown that plan? Yeah, there's there's um, typically no penalties. So most benefit plans are paid on a month to month basis. And although you um, your pricing is set for that benefit year, you aren't locked in for that benefit year. Um, and if there was a plan where that was the case, I would caution someone to watch <coughs> out for that. Um, but for the most part, if you you know were with let's say Canada Life for five years, and for whatever reason you decided that Sun Life was going to be a better choice for you, you should be able to just head on over um, from one month to the next and carry it forward. Yeah, right on. Well, that's all the questions that we, Ronnie, did you have any questions before we pop off? No. Okay, um, I want to personally thank you very much, Jessica, for uh, for taking the time, um, you know, on a volunteer basis, I might add, to come and uh, spread oh. some information around to our client base and to our followers on uh, on LinkedIn. 
and, and uh, other social channels. And I just want to put uh, Jessica's contact information back up on the screen. If you want to get a hold of her or anybody over at Cooliard, I encourage you to. It's a great group to work with, and uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to help you out. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.